Good morning, Prince George Winyaw family, and welcome to Advent 4, uh, the last Sunday uh, before Christmas next week. It's going to be a busy uh, Sunday and week following, so please check out the e-news. Please uh, call the church office if you plan on attending any of those services or RSVP through Realm. Um, we need to know how many folks are here so we can keep the services at a, at a safe capacity. The children's service is already full, but we are going to Facebook live stream that. So you'll be able to watch that uh, from home if you've got relatives, uh, young children that are in that. Caroline Stalvey is going to be preaching at that 5 o'clock service. And then we'll have a 7.30 service here in the church and an 11.30 service that night with Christmas morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we have a hayride uh, tonight that starts at the church at 5 and leaves and travels around downtown Georgetown to six folks uh, who are shut in or who haven't been getting out as much as they'd like to followed by a s'mores in the backyard of the rectory. So if you've got small children or if your family would like to come, you can follow the caravan safely in your own car. We're gonna get out, uh, light some candles and sing in each person's yard a couple of hymns or songs uh, for the Christmas season. And then this week, the children of our church are gonna be wrapping gifts, uh, all of the gifts that have poured in generously from this church and taking them over to Prince George Nursing Home in Marysville on Tuesday. And uh, I think that's, the bulk of what's going on this week. So please uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, let the office know if there's anything you need or if it, let me know if there's anything you need. And I look forward to celebrating Christmas in this beautiful space with everyone. Our service this morning actually will begin on page 145. Please stand with an Advent acclamation. Page 145 in the Book of Common Prayer. Surely the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Join me on page 106 with the Colic for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And as we are sorely hindered by our sins from running the race that is set before us, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. Please turn to page 259 in your pew Bible for our first reading from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, found on page 259. It's page 259. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you be a me a house to dwell in. I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the names of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. 
when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks God. God. Please turn to page 447 in the Book of Common Prayer to Psalm 132. We will read responsibly by half verse from verse 8 through verse 19, found on page 447. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place. You and the arm of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. And let your saints sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, turn not away the presence of your anointed. The Lord has made a faithful oath unto David, and he shall not shrink from it. Of the fruit of your body, shall I set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their children also shall sit upon the throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion for himself. He has longed for her to be his habitation. This shall be my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have a delight therein. I will bless her provisions with increase. And will satisfy her full with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall rejoice in sin. There shall I make the horn of David flourish. I have prepared a land for my anointing. As for his enemies, I shall clothe them with shame. Upon his head shall Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall. Amen. Please turn to page 951 in your Pew Bible for our third reading, which is from the book of Romans, chapter 16, beginning at verse 25, found on page 951. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. 
and the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight always, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent. The waiting is almost over. Advent 4, the last purple candle is lit this morning. Next week's Christmas. And the moment I've been waiting for, I imagine many of us, many shopkeepers and others, the manger, the celebrating, the full-on birth of Jesus Christ. In a new way, right? Isn't that what we've been preaching about and talking about and reading about these last three or four weeks of Advent? That there is a new way of living. That Jesus Christ is going to inaugurate when he comes a new way of life. So haven't some of us been asking ourselves as we maybe have been doing an Advent devotional or as we've listened extra hard this, this season to the readings or as we've tried to pray a little more earnestly during these last four weeks? Haven't, haven't many of us asked God to, to give us maybe this year a different Christmas? I think it's the cry of many people's hearts. It's the cry of the church's heart down through the ages. Lord, change us, renew us, reshape us. Many of us, I believe, have wanted and prayed this year for something different. Not the same old, same old. Something like new hearts. We talk about that, having our hearts renewed. New eyes to see. New love for our fellow men and women. Well, then we have to ask, how do we feel? How do we feel in the fourth week of Advent? Do we feel changed? Are we changed? Why are we changed? Or why not are we changed? Or if we feel sort of changed, maybe it's a little emotionalism, maybe it's the season, maybe we feel like we could be changed, then what? I think many of us, if we have that feeling, that inkling, that maybe something could be different this year, the second thing we pause to think about is, please, Lord, don't let this go away. Don't let this end. Don't let me slip back into the same old, same old. Back into the same pattern of worry or fear or waiting or planning right after Christmas for this year's New Year's party or like some of us, me, planning on the excuses you're going to make to get out of going to New Year's Eve Christmas parties. So after three weeks of reflecting and waiting, I'm really left pondering this question and maybe it's a question many of us are asking, could this year be different? And I'm not talking just COVID vaccine different. Praise the Lord, it seems as if two companies, two pharmaceutical companies are rapidly getting that vaccine out that would be a miracle but what i'm talking about is could we really as a church could we really individually start to believe and take heart the promises of god and if we did if we took those to heart how would our lives be changed well i think no surprise the answer can be found in this week's gospel from luke what we heard read about mary and the part that was left out the beginning of that first chapter of luke where another faithful character Another person who loves God like it seems Mary does. We're given these two people to kind of take apart, dissect, and look at their lives. We, don't, we didn't hear it today, but I want to encourage people to go back and start at chapter 1 in the beginning and read through the account of a man named Zachariah. He's, his story is identical to Mary's. He's visited by an angel. He's a priest. And when the angel visits him and gives him the good news that his very old wife, much like Sarah and Abraham. He's a priest, remember? He's read the holy books. But much like Sarah and Abraham, he's told, you're going to have a baby. And he can't believe it. He won't believe it. He refuses to believe it. And then later in the chapter, we get Mary. Same scenario. She's visited by an angel. She has a question about virgin birth. Who wouldn't? And immediately, she's transformed into a depth of belief that has made her famous in the church and down through the ages. Down through the ages, not just as Christ's mother, but as a person of magnificent faith. Magnificent faith. So that's what I want to do today. I want, to, I want us to compare and contrast the two of them briefly. And I want to zero in on the difference. Because I believe studying the similarities between these two apparently God-fearing people it's safe to surmise, I think, from the text that both of them are believers. Both of them are churchgoers. One has even, the priest, decided to dedicate his life to serving in the temple. He's all in, as they'd say. He's dressed like me, sort of. He's given his life 
to the service of God. The other is a young girl with a solid faith background, we could say. I think we can tell that by the way she talks to the angel. And here's the thing, don't forget, they both get the desire of their heart. Zechariah, week after week, went into that temple praying for a child, asking God to give him the desire of his heart. Mary, I'm sure as she thought about being married to Joseph, the betrothed, she imagined like all girls do, what their wedding day would be like, what it would be like to start a family, the desire of her heart. Both of them are given the desires of their heart later in the story. But at this point in the story, what I want to look at is their different reactions to their God encounter. One person, Mary, glorifies God at that moment and is famous for it down through time. The other is struck mute by the angel until his son is born. One lives into God's promises in an obedient and childlike way, while the other, based on the facts, refuses to trust and believe. So if this Christmas and this new year are going to be truly different, if we're going to have to risk having more belief, then I believe what the Lord must do for us is he must help us take a page out of Mary's book and lead us more fully into becoming two things. Two things, and they're simple and easy to remember. The first is, lead us into becoming more willing, and the second is to lead us into becoming more aware. And I know, and I believe, and I have experienced that if we're given those two new postures of being more willing and more aware, then the result will be, at least in my experience, changing us into becoming more trusting and believing. That's what would make this year different. Deeper trust and deeper belief. But it isn't that easy, is it? I say it often in sermons. Uh, first of all, faith and trust are very hard. And secondly, they have to be practiced. And we're, we're not, as human beings, prone to want to practice things that are hard, are we? Like training for a marathon, or studying for an exam, or getting a paper in that's due. We, we aren't really given. Our first nature for most of us is not to really double down our efforts. Most of us will just throw our hands up and say, well, that's just too hard. One of the reasons our faith is hard is because it constantly requires us to suspend. It requires us to suspend what we've been taught in school or often by other well-attended people. Uh, parents tell their kids they want them to grow up and be self-sufficient. Uh, they want them to grow up and be able to call their own shots. They want them to be able to stand on their own two feet. But God's ways, God's scripture, often seems very, very countercultural to that advice. Don't believe me? Let's look at a couple. Jesus says if somebody strikes you, if somebody punches you in the jaw, offer them the other jaw. If someone asks you on a cold day for your coat, don't just give them your coat, give them your coat and your shirt. If someone asks you to go one mile for them, you go too, Jesus says. Hear what I mean? How countercultural Jesus' advice is to us? He can't be serious, right? That's not going to play out well in the real world. That type of living won't sustain me, Jesus, in this real world. Well, I think his response to that would be exactly. It sure won't, because to be sustained by this world won't bring you eternal life. Not to mention that our faith requires us to believe or take someone else's word on a great deal of strange things. Take this gospel story, for instance. Angels? How many people have seen angels? I know some people who have, and I have too once in somebody's driveway. That's for another sermon. But you'd have to take my word on that, wouldn't you? As I describe what I believe to be an angel, what it looked like, where it was standing, what it was doing. Some of you would say, well, okay, Gary, if you think so. Or virgin birth. Doctors, medical personnel, people who study biology at all. Virgin birth. You see what I'm saying? We have to take that on faith. And what about those two interesting truths of many in the Bible? Do we really believe them? I do. I'm dressed funny to prove it. We, I do believe them, but I have to take them on faith. Society will often say, well, I've never seen something like that or heard of that happening in my life, but if that's what you believe, then that's okay for you. It's relativism. Whatever you want to believe is okay. Everything's okay. Everything we believe has the same weight. Well, if that's true, then nothing matters. Or others could say, like Pete Williams about the Brick Project, I'll believe it when I see it. Missouri, that state in the Midwest, their motto is the show me state. It's part of our fabric of society that's built into the American can-do attitude. I'll believe it when I see it, or prove it to me. Prove it to me. That's the cry of Zachariah's heart, by the way. 
A final reason why believing is so hard is because at the end of any sermon like this one, or at the end of your time with Jesus reading scripture, we're left having to trust the promises of God, these preached or written promises. And all of us, every last one of us has had experience in promises being broken, human promises being broken. The scripture says human promises and the promises of God are not the same, are they? And has God ever really broken his promise? I mean, really, has God ever broken his promise? We didn't say, well, what are his promises? Well, let's see. Let me name a few promises of God. He promises to love. Love so deeply that he'd give up his life for us. He promises to care. Care so much and forever that he gives the same power of the spirit of resurrection, the Holy Spirit, to each and every person who trusts and believes. God promises to protect. Not just here, not just here, we need to expand, but for eternity. Stop being so narrow-minded. Stop thinking that this earth, this day, this thing is all there is. God's promise is that he'll protect us forever. COVID can't kill us if we die in Christ, Ryan, Ryan preached a while back. COVID can just take our earthly breath away. And then in the very next moment, Jesus is going to be standing there and he's going to give us our eternal breath. God's promises are true. So if they're true, are we nurturing the relationship that stands between us and those promises? Are we seeking the Lord daily in every decision? Do we invite him to lead us, as the psalm says, Psalm 25, 3, Lord, teach me your paths and show me your ways. Is that the first cry of our heart in the morning? Or is it, oh no, I've got to get up for another day? No, brothers and sisters, the cry of our hearts has to be, Teach me your paths and show me your ways. I'm sure that was Mary's cry every morning. In order for our belief and trust to grow, we have to cultivate that relationship with the Lord. Both Mary and Zachariah did for sure. Mary, by blind obedience and a childlike faith, Zachariah, by practice and repeated faith and trust. He became what he practiced, in other words. What we need from God to get that far is what I mentioned earlier. We need to be more willing let me give you an example of someone who was willing. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, hung on to, not let go of. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant or a slave, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself even lower. He was willing to go even deeper in humiliation by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ was willing. I think if we start every day with that thought that Jesus Christ came to earth as a baby and a man to save us, to save me, our days would go different. We would be more inclined to be more willing followers. Calling folks lately who have been suggested to me as vestry nominations, um, I had this experience, and they all replied essentially the same. Um, some laughed at the idea of being on the vestry, like Sarah and Abraham or Zachariah. Some said right off the bat, no way, I'm, I'm not vestry material. But almost all reacted with this, why me? Why did you call me? Who gave you my name? And then yesterday, most of them, called me back to declare that they had their hearts changed, and they replied, well, I'm willing, and this is a paraphrase, if the vestry and the Lord need me. That's the posture I'm talking about. I'm willing if the vestry needs me. Eugene Peterson, in his book that we're getting ready to start with the Inklings, Running With Horses, says this, our faith is not a matter of the right arrangements, the right places, or the right words. Our faith is a matter of life and of love, of mercy and obedience of persons, and a passion of faith. I love that. Listen to the end of that again. It's a life of love and of mercy and obedience and of persons and a passion of faith. Most certainly, all of us don't always do what the Lord asks. We're not always willing. But in my experience and over the course of many others' lives, I've seen that as they agreed to follow him, as they agreed, sometimes painfully, that his way is the best, even when they can't see it at the time, even when everything seems to appear to the contrary, they become 
more willing in my experience to have the eyes of their heart open and they begin to become more aware. That's the second piece. More aware in this case means more willing to walk in the power of God's spirit. I don't mean unattached and aloof. I don't mean floating around in some kind of super holy posture. Actually, I mean just the opposite. I mean, think about this. How many of us have compassion on others when they hurt us instead of criticizing them? How many of us, when we deal with difficult people, ask the Lord, who hurt them? Because we all know hurt people hurt others. And what if the Lord revealed to us at that moment who had hurt them or how they had been hurt? How might we react to being hurt by them then? There's a story Stephen Covey tells about a child misbehaving on a train, driving all the other passengers crazy. And by the time the train gets to its second to the last stop, the father and this very misbehaved child get up. He puts the child in his arms and he looks at the remaining passengers and says, I'm so sorry he's been like this for the last hour, but you see, we've just come from his mother's funeral. What if everybody on that train knew that from the beginning? Would they give that child more grace instead of having sat there cutting their eyes at the child? What if we did that with other people? That's a situational awareness that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Do we ask him to make us more aware? Do we see the homeless in Georgetown and have pity on them? One person in our congregation does. I've been made aware that one person in our congregation has taken the man who typically camps out between the two gas stations over here and has put him in an apartment and is paying for him to live for a period of time. One person in our congregation is having himself be made by the Holy Spirit more aware. That person has responded to what he has seen. And over time, that person is going to become a more aware person, which will ultimately lead him and others into becoming more trusting. And that's what this gospel gets boiled down to, in my opinion. Blind, obedient, foolish trust. Mary sitting there, angel comes into the room. Oh, you're an angel? Mary putting two and two together and going, well, angels are sent by God. And then Mary beginning to listen to this fantastic story that the angel lays out in front of her about how she's going to be an instrument of God's salvation for the world. Luke's gospel reminds us that there are two ways to live our lives. Essentially, as Jesus followers, we could be completely, or some may say naively, like Mary. Or we can be like Zechariah, who at the beginning of the chapter questioned God's motive and filtered them through his mind and the way the world operates. Proverbs warns us about doing that. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord only with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Are we living like that? Are we listening to the events that happen around us in the world and asking questions like, where are you, God? Are we being constantly surprised when we experience God? Taken off guard? Are we spending time wondering, where in the world is God? Or are we being more like Mary, believing that all things are controlled by God? Trusting that the current events of this world are somehow under his control. In other words, do we allow what is on television, in the news, or in the papers to shape our belief about God? Or does our belief in God shape what we see and hear on television? Think about that for a second. Are we sitting in front of the television panic and asking, where are you, Lord? Or are we confident before we turn the TV on that the Lord is present, let's see what's going on in the world, and then let's filter that through the truth and promises of Scripture. So here's the conclusion. There's two ways we can respond to God's supernatural power. Like Zechariah, who is the husband of Elizabeth, who is going to deliver a son named John, who is Mary's cousin. John the Baptist. Same family. Mary and Elizabeth different reactions to the supernatural intervention of God? Or do we respond like Mary, who just may have remembered the promises found in Isaiah 7, 14? She may have trusted them and been just a little more willing so that when the angel showed up, she was a little more aware, which ultimately led her to believe those promises from the prophet Isaiah from long, long ago. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Mary the Virgin, remembering having heard that. The angel Gabriel announcing that the child is going to be born to a virgin. She puts them together and her trust goes deeper. This new year could be different for each and every one of us if we decided to step out in faith like that. If we decided to trust and rely on the promises of God found in Scripture. 
When we do, then like Mary, we begin to become more willing to follow and obey. For some of us, this Christmas and Advent may mark the first time we choose to believe like that. Believe with childlike faith. Maybe like Mary, with a little more confidence than before. Literally dying, some of us, from the broken promises of this life. The promises that have been offered by humans, not by God. And from the exhaustion, many of us, in trying to get this done under our own strength. Maybe today's the day we just throw up our hands and surrender and say, Lord, it's either your way or no way. We do what's very counterintuitive, as I said at the beginning. I'm going to give you one last story about counterintuition. I took a scuba diving course years ago. And one of the things you had to do in order to pass the course was you had to go down to 90 feet with the scuba gear on. And you're relatively new. It's been only a couple weeks. And what the instructor wants you to do is remove the regulator, the thing that's actually giving you breath, and then let it dangle by your side and free ascent to the surface. Well, 90 feet is a lot further than the bottom of the 12-foot swimming pool. Remember at the bottom of the 12-foot pool, you're holding your breath and you push off and you come to the surface and you take a big gasp of air because holding your breath just for a couple seconds seems like an eternity. So when you're faced with this uh, part of the test, when you're faced with this strange idea that somehow I'm going to take the regulator out and have enough air in my lungs to go 90 feet, our natural reaction is to think, oh no, I'm going to hold my breath until I get up there and pray I swim fast enough to make it. If you do that, brothers and sisters, you will embolize. At the bottom of 90 feet, the compressed air in our lungs is already um, diminished. It's smaller than it normally is because of the three different atmospheres. If you take that molecule of air to the surface, it will expand three times. So if you have a lung full of compressed air and you hold your breath at 90 feet, you could risk rupturing your lungs. Ever taken something to the bottom of the pool and watch it get uh, folded under the pressure of the water? It's exactly the same thing that happens only in opposite. So what you have to do is you have to trust. You have to believe the instructor. And you have to just barely open your lips and begin to either uh, paddle with your feet or allow your best to bring you to the surface in a controlled and reasonable way. And you will not ever run out of air. You will have plenty of air. You'll actually get to the surface and you won't gasp. You'll get to the surface and go, wow, that was easy. But it's mind-boggling and almost impossible. But you have to trust what the instructor tells you, what he's told hundreds of other true students before you, and you have to believe it was true, even if you didn't fully understand it, fully understand physics, or even believe it. That's the faith that Mary has. What we heard this morning read in Romans was this. Now to him is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, his presence in the world. According to that revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for ages. Remember what I said about Mary remembering Isaiah's promise that had been promised down through the ages that a virgin would bear the Savior of the world. Here's the conclusion of Romans. But has now been, at this moment, 2020 even, disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. The Bible said it according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. The secret is out, brothers and sisters. Jesus is who he claims to be. He is alive and he is with us now. Believe that now and live differently. Live more willingly, more aware and with more faith. That's how this year can be different, living with more faith. It's the difference between... Um, ECMO, which is a procedure that they do for people with heart bypass, and actually living off the machine. When they, when they bypass someone's heart, what doctors do is they stop it from beating. And they plug tubes into a person, and they take the blood out of the person, the life that's in the blood is the oxygen, they take it outside the person's body, they oxygenate it artificially, and they put it back in. Well, for the six or seven hours that person's in surgery, they're still alive, but they're artificially alive. A machine is keeping them alive. I'm talking about real life. I'm talking about the life that's possible by the beating of one's own heart. The life that's possible resting in the arms of someone you love, resting in the arms of Jesus. That's the life that's promised to us. Believe that and live differently this year. Live this year more willingly. Live this year more aware. Live this year, best of all, more alive and with more faith. Amen.
Turn with me now to page 109. Let's confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness, and so guide and direct their leaders, especially Donald, our president, Henry, our governor, and our local leaders, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, we pray especially for the protection of the men and women serving in our armed forces and all fire, law enforcement, EMS, and first responders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Foley Beach Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America, Bishop Mark Lawrence, Fitz Allison, Bishop in Residence, Gary, our rector, and the Reverend Fred Onyango, and all the people of our partnership, Diocese of Masano South, Kenya, that by their life and teaching, they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts, we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, today we pray for Grace Anglican Parish in Little River, South Carolina, and their new rector, Reverend Cindy Larson, in their new location at Wampy Methodist. Almighty Father, we pray that, we may, that they may be faithful witnesses for Jesus Christ and empowered by your Holy Spirit to serve you in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world and strengthen us to fulfill your great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially for our parish prayer list, Olga Abbott. Edie Benson, Joyce Bourne, Lett Boyd, Sheila Butler, Jerry Duff, Ed Grant, Eliza Jagger, Ernest Meyer, Laura Meyer, Sharon Miller, Kathy Morgan, Kay Mauer, Roger Mauer, Harold Ness, Pat Knopf, Joy Ann Sasser, Marilyn Sinclair, Pat Stalvey, Joe and Sally Steen, John Tiller, Emily West, Janet Williams, and also for the family and friends of Prince George Church, for Alan, Bill, Billy, Charles, Cheryl, Chip, Catherine, Chris, Christine, Dale, Debbie, Diana, Douglas, Frank, Fulton, Genia, Jerry, 
Henry, Jackson, James, Jeff, Jennifer, Jerry, Jim, Jonathan, Julian, Kaylee, Lynn, Lily, Lisa, Marion, Martha, Mike, Miriam, Nick, Peggy, Philip, Robert, Robin, Rupert, Sarah, Sue, Susie, Tim, Tootie, Virginia, and Wesley. And for all others whom we now name before God, and those whom we have forgotten, would you, O oh Lord, remember? Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. we remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for the Bishop Search Committee. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church, and so guide the minds of those who shall choose a bishop coadjutor for the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will uh, preach the gospel, care for your people, equip us for ministry, and lead us forth in fulfillment of the Great Commission. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Page 112. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker and judge of us all, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses, which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your righteous anger against us. We are deeply sorry for these our transgressions. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you all, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Greet one another with a wave and a smile. God's peace. An offertory sentence from 1 Peter. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You may be seated.
to page 115. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son, Jesus, to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs of him of everlasting life. And when he shall come again in power and great glory to judge the world, we may, without shame or fear, rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, to forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You may remain standing, kneel, or be seated. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue, a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. So now, O merciful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts and creatures of bread and of wine, that we, receiving them according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of your dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, your humble servants, celebrate and make here before your divine majesty with these holy gifts, the memorial your Son commanded us to make, remembering his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and his promise to come again. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. We humbly pray that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive 
the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah! We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You may be seated. If you have communion at home, now is the time to receive it. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Turn with me, please, to page 677 and join me in praying this prayer for spiritual communion, prayer number 106. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, gathered around every altar of your church. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Now join me, please, in praying our post-communion prayer found on page 121. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food and the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. It's one.
Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.